question with the class. We're trying to bring it full circle and bring it into the context of continued U.S.-Cuban relations as they evolve. What can we expect? What do the Cubans expect? What, are the, what do Americans expect? And are they the same or are they different? Um, I will say that the biggest thing I got is Cubans are hopeful. I mean, when they thought President Obama was coming in his motorcade, they flooded the streets. They are very, very excited at the new possibilities that are coming with these changing relations. Um, some of the things they're most excited for, we've kind of laid out, so normalized global trade. A lot of people, I think, that haven't studied Cuba, I know me personally, when you learn about the Cuban Missile Crisis in U.S. history class, and you learn about all of that, they don't go into depth about what the embargo is. And the embargo, it, it's not just the United States choosing not to do business with Cuba, it's the United States choosing not to do business with Cuba and saying anybody else who does business with Cuba can't do business with the U.S. Which, when you compare the Cuban market versus the U.S. market, that's a big deal. So who are they going to pick? They're going to pick the U.S. So because of that, Cuba has been cut off from normalized global trade, imports, exports, access to materials. So they're excited and they're hopeful about normalized global trade to be a part of what is now that industry. So FDI, you know, foreign direct investment. We all know that in developing nations, that is a key part of a growing economy. So they're excited about the opportunity for not only U.S. investors, but investors from other countries as well after the embargo may be lifted. Um, economic quality, we've talked about their limited access to, you know, goods, services, materials, their infrastructure is crumbling, they don't have a lot of resources to fix that, um, and state salary increases, being a communist country, the socialist government, the average salary is between $25 and $30 a month, and it doesn't matter if you're working in a restaurant or if you're a chemical engineer, you know, these incomes do not have a huge gap like they do in the United States. Our bus driver, for example, was a trained chemical engineer who drove bus for a living because he made more money. A lot of these state jobs are hoping for um, salary increases so that these families can thrive and that they can grow. Um, off of that, another thing moving forward with normalized relations would be access to technology and media. We kind of already touched on that, but a key part of that is Cuba is known for its education system and like Kim was saying, almost everybody has a college degree or has some sort of very higher um, quality education. And so with that, Cuba wants to be on the forefront of cutting edge technology, cutting edge research, but they just don't have access to that collaborative knowledge and that kind of shared learning that we engage with, like within the U.S. domestically, but also abroad, and just kind of sharing research and sharing what developments have been made, because you can only do so much alone. Um, so that's definitely something they're looking forward to, especially with uh, research on biotechnology because of their healthcare system coupled with their education system. And then also there is a huge um, lack of access to essential goods, especially toiletries. Our tour guide was telling us she'll sometimes go three or four months without soap, without shampoo, just kind of those basic um, hygiene toiletries. And then also she was saying how, uh, oh actually this just kind of we learned from a lot of different people, but like toilet paper, we were told to bring our own roll when we were there. And a lot of people use one of the newspapers just because that's more frequently found than toilet paper. Um, also food products, milk is a scarcity for sure. Cows, you can go to jail longer if you kill a cow than if you kill a person, which is always just kind of eye-opening. Um, the milk is all, for the most part, um, powdered or dehydrated. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of, it's just a completely different dynamic Okay, now we have some pictures. This is us at the Revolutionary Museum. I think that's all of our group, right? I think so. Yeah, I think so. And I think so, too, as we're going through pictures, uh, I want to just open the floor for any questions that anybody might have. There was so much. I'm sure we might have missed something. If you're curious about something specifically, we will do our best. Otherwise, Randy is here. I'm sure he's always willing to jump right in there to answer anything. Dylan's here. Yeah, Dylan over there in the corner with the... And Brad, and Brad, and Brad. Brad came. They're, oh, they're Brad classmates of ours. <laughs> so they went on the trip with us. us. I'm sure between any of us we can try to answer any questions you may have. Yep. So this is a picture of the whole group. Sugar cane. So those are called cocos and they're these tiny little taxis that were open air. And um, they would just zoom through, like past the Malacon. It was amazing. There was they were um, a little bit cheaper than taxis, and it was just a fun experience. This is, I think. It was in Havana Vieja, mm -hmm. but which plaza? Oh, so there's 
recipes are amazing. Oh, this is me with, <laughs> I bought, um, Randy helped me with this one. So this Fidel um, book with all of these really great pictures, and I wanted to get it for my family and p use it as like a coffee table book. And Randy helped me barter it down, um, and I, I gave this man um, these little pins that we all have right now, and it's a U.S. flag and a Cuban flag. So I traded those two pins and then a, a couple of um, kooks, and then I got this book, <laughs> thanks to Randy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in um, the booksellers square. Oh, this is when we ra rode in a classic convertible down the Malacan. So that was, was that taken, was that picture taken by you? I don't know. Somebody in the backseat. Yeah, yeah. Somebody. it was really fun. So riding a classic I will car. say that was an interesting perspective too. A lot of us all see the, the classic pictures of Havana and of Cuba with all these 1950s classic cars that make some collectors drool because they can't find them anywhere here in the States. Um, and these cars have been running on a daily basis for 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. They're just so resourceful. So a lot of them have been um, restored and the nicer quality ones, the convertibles, they charge more money. And you can cruise through the city and take tours. Again, the sugar cane. So that's when you could bite the little stick that my friend and I. The white part. Yep, the white part. Oop. Well, that's pretty much it. So <laughs> that's the sugar industry. This is one of our speakers. Um, this is just a basic layout of we would have a lecture and all sit um, close to each other and just learn whatever um, the speaker was talking about. This one was about entrepreneurship, I'm oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. But that was really interesting because um, we learned about the legal side and then we saw it in practice with this group that had like a home gym for the community and a salon, spa and services. And art artisan crafts. Mm -hmm. Did Randy make arrangements for all of these? Yes. yes. Like I said, everything is to amaze us, the connections. Everything we did. By the end, they called him Professor Indiana Jones. Yeah. <laughs> it may have had something to do with the white hat he bought, too. <laughs> this is at the Sugar Factory. Um, we have a picture a little bit later, and you'll see it, all of the bags of sugar. So just wait for that. It's amazing. We will say for the record that if OSHA ever saw this, it would be shut down immediately. Yep. <laughs> um, the uh, guidelines for safety and you know cleanliness and everything else are very different between the U.S. and Cuba. Yeah, I saw workers walking through, uh, just shirts unbuttoned. <laughs> like hard hats were. Hard hats were optional. I have no idea. Sure. Yeah, there's like welding going on. I don't, I don't think they have. They didn't wear masks when they were welding. We were like hopping over like. The This is just a cute picture of us. <laughs> oh, here's, here's Randy <laughs> taking a selfie with all of us in the same convertible that Julia talked about. With Randy's angels. Yeah. <laughs> Randy's daughters. <laughs> oh, here's, there were, there were dogs, um, a lot of stray dogs. And it was sad to see, but that was really fun because we saw a puppy. So I didn't touch it, though. So because Randy said that if we got bitten, he we would have to get rabies time. shots. <laughs> so I was like, but that was a cute puppy. Dinner? This was Yeah, one of the meals. And this was one of the three course meals too. So tablecloth, nice. Oh yeah, we learned our food. fine dining etiquette. Yes. Yeah. That's just a picture um, at the cannon ceremony. Um, Randy mm -hmm. took us there one of the nights, and that's just a picture of me, but it's more so you look at the cobblestone, and we were able to see um, the cannon ceremony firsthand, which was really cool. The so there's, there's this old fort, and from the colonial era times, where there was this huge wall around uh, Havana. So they shoot off a cannon so that they would know to close the doors of the city of Havana, so that if you were on the right side, you should quickly hop in or hop out, depending on where you're supposed to be. And so the cannon was just, now it's a symbolic, historic thing that they do every night at 9 o'clock. So that was a really cool thing, because you could hear it all throughout the city. One of the interesting things about that night was that it was sponsored by our executive MBA students. Mm -hmm. So we, we had, a, it wasn't a part of our program. We had the bus, transportation, a nice dinner yeah. up on the 
the, behind the fortress, uh, entrance to the park, mm -hmm. uh, and some other things of that sort. And before the trip, we had an auction with the executive MBA students in the business school. I auctioned off some Cuban photos, a few Cuban cigars, and uh, <laughs> their auction raised thirteen hundred dollars to sponsor that event and some other things that we were able to do that went beyond what we could include in our program with the budget that we had. So that was really nice of those students. Oh, yeah. All right. Sure. We went to basically miniature Egypt uh, with all these huge pyramids of bags of sugar. Um, and then there was this mound of raw sugar that was, I think, 500,000 tons? Or no, five, something. That, that, that much per month. Yeah, so <laughs> it was this giant, giant, basically sand castle of all of this raw sugar, and we had the opportunity to just like yeah, take well, some and <laughs> put it in our mouth. Where did it go? Hmm? It's one of their largest exports. So. Where, where China? China is one of their big exports for sugar. I want to say some other places in Latin America and the Caribbean they may export to, but China is their greatest. Venezuela. Venezuela. Oh, yeah. Another group picture. This was us at um, Fuster's house. So Fuster is um, an artist, a Cuban artist, and he uses mosaic style art, and he decorated his entire house that way. And his, he's working on um, expanding his mosaicism into the entire neighborhood. So he has decorated his neighbor's houses as well in this mosaic pattern. So that was really cool to see, because he's a definitely um, an art, a Cuban art icon. Yeah, I, I will definitely say that for, I will get right to you, I promise. Um, for being a socialist and communist country, they really encourage the arts, and there's a huge art community within Cuba. And as Randy explained to us, um, Fuster is now, just now making his way to the United States, some of his work is, and it's being sold for upwards of $5,000 per piece. So I feel like it's only a matter of time before he continues to grow and we see many other artists come out of Cuba. I, I wanted to ask about sure. the whole I feel like there's a wide variety that they do. What was most interesting to me is we went through the community of Las Terrasas and they have to be so um, resourceful. So there was a, an artist there who liked to draw and liked to paint and did screen printing. He actually had to make his own paper because they couldn't just order in paper the way that we do in the same way. So he would use recycled cardboard. He would use different natural ingredients for dyes and things like that. So I feel like for the art community, we saw a little bit of everything. Photography, mosaics, pottery, printing, you know, drawing. I mean, you wood yeah, woodcrafting, you name it, we saw it. So. Dance and theater. Yep, there's a lot of dance. They, we went to a, an, an art studio while they, we were there. They did dancing. They had their own music. There's music everywhere. So I think anything you can think of, you're going to find it there. I think one of the coolest things about Cuba is every place has a lot of music which is not something we see here. Like, it's a special treat when there's live music here. But when we were in Cuba, like, it was just kind of an expectation that there's going to be music, it's going to be live. Which was really cool, because it got everybody up and dancing all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was just a picture of me talking with our tour guide, Yanai. And our, actually, our tour guide, Yanai, was amazing. She really helped us and accommodated us. So she was definitely a blessing to have on the trip um, as our tour guide. Oh, that's me at Brewster's. And just, like his whole house was just covered in tiles. So this is like the third floor. And you can just see down. It's just so much. Okay. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, that's me in Plaza Vieja. Um, what's really cool about this picture is I really like the architecture in the back. And I think it's cool how there's this human flag blowing in the wind um, this particular day. I think I was with Randy, Kim, and then a few other classmates. So that it was really cool to be able to witness this. And there's a statue and a fountain. So it was just beautiful to see this. <coughs> yeah? Um, so in that plaza, uh, I'm just curious, because I can't tell from the picture, but is the fountain surrounded by a uh, pencil? Yeah. OK. Um, it goes back and forth, because the conservator of the city's office has been you know, conserving the square. Um, but it's always interesting to see when they take the fence down and when it comes back. 
I would say the duration of our trip, it was up. We visited that um, plaza several times, and every single visit, the, the gate was up. Randy, have you ever been there with when the I gate being down? I remember that it was down. It might also be with like the pink terrain. Yeah. That might be it. It might just be the, you know, the peak tourist season mm -hmm. trying to protect it. Because this, this restoration is an example of a systematic effort, as you yeah. know, of the city historian's office using funding from the hotels, the cost particulares, and the restaurants that are in the district. Part of that revenue being used to restore, because this is not what the rest of Havana looks like. No, not at all. Mm. Yeah? open up discussion a little bit, that's okay. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Time. So I wonder how much before you went, um, how much you studied about socialism, and you mentioned socialism, communism, communism in one phrase, as if they're the same thing, mm -hmm. they're not. They're, yeah, they're and not, I, I apologize. A lot of the child, quote unquote, challenges you mentioned, of the crappy internet access are um, challenges, if that's the word we need. Of, of traveling abroad, of traveling outside the United States, and some of the issues that you've come across about um, a lack of resources, a lack of products, are the direct result of the incredible bullying of the US trade embargo, and have nothing mm -hmm. to do with socialism or communism, which are not the same thing, um, per se. And I'm not hearing you engage with that. I, I'm hearing a very a tourist approach to socialism stroke communism, and I'm just wondering whether you're leaving that out of the talk or whether that's something For us, most of the original course before we left was dedicated to the history. So we had to learn about the early roots, and so that started with socialism, which is now transitioned into communism, which is kind of why we clustered them together, just because of what it was and what it is now. Um, so yeah, that is misleading in that sense. But I think for us, it's just really hard for us to wrap our minds around what exactly happened, and what is happening, and what's going on, and um, just Okay, what was the second half of it? The, the role of the embargo. There we go. Yeah, the role of the embargo. Which they actually called a blockade, so. Yeah, that was a huge focal point of our, our class and of our time there, especially because we were focusing so much on this business aspect. Um, like, when you first go there, you don't kind of realize it's going on. But when I first came back into the Miami airport, I was like, oh my gosh, we have advertisement everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just kind of realize, like, it slowly fades away. but. In Cuba, the role of advertisement is more promoting the message of the Castro family and just working together in hard work. And for us, it was really interesting to see a lot of times people were just hanging out, sometimes just because they were waiting for Obama. But uh, a couple of our speakers described to us that there was a lack of incentive to work. But then you'd also talk to people on the street, and they were all about working for the common good. And I know in my casa particular, uh, specifically, um, my hosts talked to me about how they knew there were a lot of problems within Cuba, but at the end of the day, everybody was all working for the same mission, and they were all very thankful for all the opportunities they had. And for me, I've traveled abroad to a couple different countries, mostly within Latin America, and I've never experienced anything like Cuba before. I don't know if that's totally your question. Yeah, I wonder to what extent, as a group, you. I mean, I think yeah. the U.S. is a kind of a, a bad place, if I may say that, to start a tour to Cuba from because of the propaganda mm -hmm. that you've been exposed to since mm -hmm. birth. And so I wonder to what extent you engaged as a group about the good things that are there in Cuba, that it's not yeah. all this terrible, terrible fate that these poor people are living. No, yeah, we were definitely very thankful of the opportunity we were given, and we learned so much from them and so much from our class. Work. What do you see them doing well? What are the Cubans doing well? Healthcare, yeah. education, mm -hmm. security. I mean, can we just acknowledge what that means? Oh, yeah. You know, this is, you know, you compare that to crappy internet access and no advertising and no shopping. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, what are we talking about? So I just wanted to bring that up because, and thank you for yeah. saying that, because these are huge points, right? Yeah. Oh, I was impressed with every speaker's understanding of economics. Like, I've only taken two courses, and I was just blown away. We were talking to one of the former ministers of the economy, and he just blew my mind with his vast knowledge. What was your impression of the impact of the embargo on what's happening now in Cuba? What's happening now in Cuba? The, the situation oh, yeah. in Cuba. I, I will preface it by saying that I think each student took something different, like we've talked about. We all come with a different background. So while Jen and I have studied a lot of area studies, and both of us have taken poli-sci courses, 
and things like that. Some other people have come in with absolutely no background in that at all. So I think it gave each of us a little bit different of a turn or a, an idea or an impression or an opinion after we've left. But um, I think the effects of the embargo, as I've talked about, um, the blockade, it limits them so much in what they can do. And, and I think that I've made that comment before. It amazed me how much they do with so little comparatively. We had the opportunity to talk to one of the healthcare professionals that now teaches. What they do with healthcare in Cuba is amazing. The preventative care, the way that they're engaged in their communities, how well they communicate with each other. They're happy people. You know, and that's something too, going in, you know, you hear about the, the propaganda from the United States, how oppressed they are, how this they are, how bad they are, how that, and you go there and you see none of those things. None of those things were prevalent to any of us, I don't believe, no matter the background. But to go in and see that, and Randy had made the comment before we left, he's like, you know, you'll be around walking somewhere and you'll feel like you're not in, you know, a country that has a, a government different than our own. And he was right. There were a lot of times where you had no idea and then you'd come across something or then something would happen and it would bring you like, yep, okay, now I can see it. But overall, I don't think that, I'm, I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but I'm hoping that you kind of get an idea that it, it was amazing. There was so, so much with so little. I still can't get over that. Okay, Rose, we'll start over here. Give us some samples of Cuban accent. Cuban accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Bobby, do you have any ideas? Because you've actually been there more so than us. Um, as a Cuban American, the older you get, it sounds like you have more marbles. That's what yeah. I was going to say. There we go. Very, Very mumbled, talk, yeah. mumbled fast. Um, we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other. So this presentation uh, is mainly just our field study. So we did an entire 
coursework of multiple per perspectives, critical thinking, critical analysis of different issues. So I highly encourage you to actually look at our syllabus that Randy was saying because we do examine a lot of things and we did a lot of critical thinking and discussion about socialism, communism, and I think Randy did a great job of providing us with that background. A lot of things of what we're saying are just our personal reactions to actually being on the ground in Cuba, which, you know, that's just how we're presenting it. But we did receive a lot of critical analysis and critical thinking. Before and we just went. keep in mind, we had, we had two days to prepare this. Um, <laughs> so. I can't even believe you guys are like up here and functioning after that whirlwind of a week. I just wanted to thank all of you for doing this presentation. It's been fascinating for me to hear your perspective. I was here the same 10 days you were, and my husband and I go back and forth a lot, both to him, Havana and Camagüey with the Wisconsin Medical Project. And I think the amount of experiences that you had and the amount of processing and thinking that you've been able to do already in this short time is incredible. And I know because I've seen um, Randy's syllabus, I know how much history and preparation he crams into that short period of time for you on such a very, very complex subject that you could study for years and years and years and go back and forth to Cuba over and over. And it's still, like you say, not a drop in the bucket of understanding some of it. I think you've done a fabulous job of giving your impressions and what you've liked and, and you know, what you saw that troubled you and what you saw that you liked. It's, you did a great job. And you're very lucky to have been on this course. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. I know we had this gentleman right over here for a while. I just wanted to reinforce what you said about learning how Cubans do so much with so little. Because I think that is the attitude about learning from Cuba for possible application back here. That would be really good to hear from you as you develop your thoughts. And it's just like just for what we can learn about urban planning from Cuba. Underneath that flag is an entryway that goes into a school, a primary school. So this is a redevelopment of a square where they keep a school, a primary school. It hasn't been developed out, which is for tourism. This is Correct. living. Around the corner is an old folks home. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like a con different concept of urban planning that, uh, that I think, that's just one example of, of, as you have gone there, I was really impressed by your conclusion. Uh, what, how could we learn from I think because, that's a great attitude for Because our, our economy, our model, is going to end. Mm -hmm. uh, and we won't have as much to do, much resources. So I think it's a very wonderful question that you, you were asking and sort of woven it into your presentation. And I, and I think it's a, it's a very, very good uh, thing to do. I thought one of the best questions, and I don't remember who asked this, but during the healthcare briefing, one of the students said, how can you help us help the U.S. healthcare system learn <laughs> from areas where you've been effective, where we have been less effective or less efficient? The sustainable movement in the state has had some communication with you. How do they grow food when they don't have fertilizers and inputs and the normal chemicals that our model has developed. Well, this, this, how do they do so much with so little? How do they still produce it that much of a, a volume with a pair of oxen instead of a plow? It's not to say that they solve their own problems because they True. have it. <laughs>
But you know, I think engaging them at a really young age like that, and you know, they they did an art project in advance and made maracas, and I brought a, a set of maracas from Cuba into class, and we danced, and I still need to write the blog post, and all that. But we have some. 